This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. <laughs> Many people feel intimidated by meditation with no idea how it feels, they may dismiss their efforts as not getting it or not doing it right. Author Petty Ludington's early struggle with this uncertainty led her to share her method, which takes out the guesswork. Her book teaches four simple exercises that demystify the process and create a clear path to the meditative state in a matter of minutes. As readers learn each exercise, they internalize and relax into the sensory experience of meditation. For beginners, the exercises slowly acquaint them with the meditative states and reassure them that it is a state of full awareness under their complete control. For the seasoned meditator, the instructions for this journey offer a fresh perspective and may allow a level of awareness beyond that previously achieved. Valeria Tellez interviews Petty Ludington, the author of Meditation Manual, Simple Directions for a Life-Changing Practice. Peggy Ludington has excelled in the many facets of her life. Lawyer, artist, writer, farmer, environmental activist, wife, and mother. However, the path to this fruitful life was rocky. Growing up in an alcoholic home left its shrapnel in her psyche. Then, as she embarked on a promising legal career, her father and mentor was arrested. The drama that followed blew a hole in her heart and her ambitions. Anxiety and depression descended. Therapy helped. Meditation was the game changer, but it took years to find her way to it, and then not easily. With her kids in college, she felt emotionally adrift. A sweat lodge experience rekindled her teenage fascination with meditation, but how to learn? In search of the right way, she read volumes by experts, listened to their recordings, attended workshops. Her early attempts left her empty and wanting something more. Finally, Peggy discovered that meditation should be simple, that there was no one right way. A friend guided her through a meditation so she could experience what it felt like. This freed her to cobble together her own path, one that includes the best parts of all those teachings. She shares this path with readers in Meditation Manual, Simple Directions for a Life-Changing Practice. Meditation now serves as the calming hub of her busy and abundant life. By expanding the richness of her inner life, meditation has expanded the richness of the life she is living. Peggy believes meditation is an important life skill, a powerful tool in the quest for wellness and wholeness. Her goal is to demystify the process, to make it easy and accessible for everyone. She hopes this book lights the way for others seeking the health and wellness benefits of a quiet mind and sitting in stillness. Meet Peggy at PeggyLuddington.com. Here is the interview with Peggy Luddington. In your own words, who is Peggy Luddington? Oh, big question. You know, I am a deeply spiritual and keenly sensitive, not wanting to say I'm a highly sensitive person, but I am very sensitive and have been my whole life. I feel like I'm a scholar and a very deep thinker. I feel very balanced between my right and left brain and as I say in my book, you know, my my uh, curriculum vitae is I've been a writer, an artist, a lawyer, an environmental activist, a farmer, a wife, mother and grandmother. But I think I'm finding that really I'm I've become a teacher 
um, sort of a guide. And I get so much pleasure in helping, especially younger people, see their way way through uh, difficult passages. It's interesting that you say that you use the word teacher guide, because when I was looking at the titles in, in your bio, I added meditation guide. I just <laughs> use that word. <laughs> so it's funny that you say it. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, I never really put those, those titles on myself, but I have found in my life, that's what it's taken me to. And speaking of that, becoming a teacher, a guide to lead others, to guide others to understand and get to know the, their inner selves, their inner world better, which I call the spiritual world, the invisible world. How did you come to that, Peggy? What is the story behind your journey to meditation and becoming a guide? Well, I have lived pretty ordinary life, but at times it's been very broken. And as a result of childhood situations and then uh, trauma within my family as I was a young adult, my world kind of broke down. I lost my, my glue <laughs> for myself and I sought some therapy at that time. I was doing really pretty well until my father was arrested and uh, that whole saga just kind of tilted me on my axis I kind of patched my life back together and got to be a mother and a wife and all these other wonderful things where my life has taken me. But I found I, I was very empty when my boys finally left for college. And I didn't quite know how to reconstitute that time. I had a therapist that had helped me and, and that was certainly very, very instrumental. But I felt disconnected from something in myself. And I knew I needed to start meditating. I had a very difficult journey finding how to do that. This was quite a few decades ago. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh -huh. you, you were kind of left to your resources of reading and attending conferences or seminars. And I did so much of that. But I found the the experience wasn't what I really wanted it to be. And I I needed to um, be able to really get at something that it was not accessing. So I had a, a lovely friend who also was a lawyer and uh, she's a medical intuitive. Her name's Christine Lang. She was seminal in helping me find a path that worked for me. And that's what I'd been using for a very long time until a friend tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, you know what? This would maybe be helpful for some other people. And I never fancied myself writing a book about meditation, but I thought, gosh, if this would help anybody, I'm, I'm all in. So yeah. that's how I got here. How wonderful. I love that too, that intention. If this will help anyone, so I'll do it. <laughs> that's a beautiful statement and way of being. And with that in mind, I have lots of questions about your book in meditation. For now, let me ask you a few open questions. What do you think is the purpose of the human experience, Peggy? I do a lot of thinking about that. <laughs> yeah. um, I actually kind of came upon this theory that we are all an, a piece of God. And why would we be here? To me, it seems that divinity doesn't necessarily appreciate its full depth and measure. And by creating these places for story to happen, there is an understanding of depth and an understanding of what, how grand and how vast and how infinite that is. And so I believe our lives are here to create story and interact with one another. Why do you think we see so much suffering? So if we came here to have fun and explore this realm in a human body, why do we suffer so much? I, in life, there's so much contrast, right? We have light and dark. Um, contrast is what illuminates to me. And so suffering, struggle, challenge, they're one end of the spectrum. And then bliss and relaxation and enjoyment are like another. And I think not only do, does that, do they kind of inform each other as a yin-yang kind of thing, but I also really believe that it's to bring us back to our interconnectedness, that when 
there is suffering, people are called to help and people do help. And that's inspirational. And it, 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 I don't know about you, but like when I see that, like in the midst of trauma, someone stepping up and really doing something, I get so inspired. And I, it feels like my heart opens at that moment in, in maybe a horrible circumstance, but I'm just like, I, I am touched in those moments. And I think we feel our common humanity at that time. True. That makes a lot of sense to me. But in a way, suffering is not the same as pain, right, Peggy? Correct. Because it's inevitable, really, to have pain here. And I do see that pain can become, in my case, it was for sure, a catalyst for so many beautiful insights and realizations. But then we have so many of us who are kind of um, caught up in holding on to the pain and not seeing the way out. And, and that is really sad to see. I see that around me, my own family. And how can meditation help us to see the way out of suffering? Not pain, but suffering. I Connecting with our whole selves by claiming our integrity of the full being, I think it, it, it puts it in perspective, pain and suffering. Suffering is just a condition. It's not a necessity. And you can change your perspective and change the amount of suffering that you have. And I think meditation helps you get a different perspective. I think it is, if practiced and, and really integrated in your life, I think it gives you more like a 30,000 foot view of your life and puts that perspective film in front of you so that you may still be struggling, but you don't have to necessarily suffer. So can you illuminate a little bit more on that, Peggy? How would you describe struggle and pain necessary and then suffering? What would be an example? <sighs> oh, <laughs> you caught me on that one. Um, <laughs> I, I think that struggle and pain are growth. It's, it's movement. Suffering is getting stuck in the loop of it. So I, I, yeah. I don't know a better way to put it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you get stuck in the loop and it repeats and it repeats. And then your mind just magnifies it and um, it doesn't stay very constructive in that state. And then um, my other questions about there's a word we use for some people who are very graceful in a way they learn and they grow from struggles and challenges and pain. And some other people, they just stay, as you said, they go on and on and on on that loop. Mm -hmm. Is there something about resilience? What is that about those human beings? What makes them navigate this reality with such a grace, growing from struggles and not getting caught up in them? I, I think, again, it is the perspective of our divinity, our own divinity, that, that we, if you can accept that we are all spiritual beings here, we are all a piece of the divine, moving forward, then you look at things a little bit different. It can, it can change your perspective. Do you consider meditation the way you experienced it and the way you guide others a spiritual practice? I think meditation in its raw state is really just a life skill. It's a life skill that takes us to a state of being. We're so used to our awakened state. And in that awakened state, our little minds take us on all these journeys and <laughs> these loops. And it, if you don't take the time to separate your understanding of your being from your mind, it's a wild ride because you're just, you, you're taken off by anxiety, taken off by anger. There are all sorts of little tracks that your mind will go down and they don't, they aren't very valuable uh, in the long run. If you take a moment and, well, take a moment, <laughs> it can take years, but if you can work at training your mind, it won't be perfectly quiet for you, but it needs to be in service of your being not just a running monologue of your life and that you'd like ice cream or that you didn't like the way that person acted to you. I, the things we spin on make us crazy. So, so true. It sometimes it feels 
almost like the mind becomes obsessed with certain things. And it's that loop again, and it keeps going, going around and around. I see that in my own mind when it comes to certain subjects. Absolutely. Not everything, but now it's very small things. But do you think that that has to do with trauma? The the looping? Yeah. Well, I mean, surely that could be part of it. But I think that there's a piece of it that's the natural way our mind works. I think our mind is always assessing, always judging, always critiquing, always telling stories. And we all very much identify with our mind. But our mind isn't really us. And so by conditioning it, just like, just like you, if you have a puppy that's just boundless energy and going <laughs> yeah. off every direction, that feels like the yes. untrained mind to me. So true. And, they, and they call it, I, I, in, I don't know in which discipline, but it's referred to as the monkey mind. Yes. Monkey and it is. Mind. It yeah. just chatters and tells you all sorts of stuff. And it's like, okay, let, could, could we slow down and let's look at what we need to be doing? And that's, I think, where sort of the mindfulness movement came into being is that it it was saying, no, be right here, right now. This is what we're looking at. Not what happened 30 minutes ago. Not the guy that cut you off on the road when you were driving here. And those are the kinds of things that, that attract our attention. It's like that movie. I don't know if you saw the, the animated movie Up, but the dog that was like every squirrel, you know, your mind's going after every squirrel. Uh, <laughs> it's it's yeah. the nature of the mind. And there's <laughs> nothing wrong with it. It doesn't mean there's something the matter with you. But you do have an opportunity to train your mind, to be in service of your being. Mm. Yes, a billion times to that. (laughs) Um, And I love the way you use the word training and not controlling. So it's not about controlling the mind, right, Peggy? What is the difference for you in trying to manage and control something and then or training something? Well, if you've tried to manage or control something or train it, mm-hmm. they're, they're very different experiences. <laughs> right. And there's so right. much resistance to control. So when training can be a partnership, and I think that's what meditation is really a partnership of your essence and your mind and coming together and finding a way that is most productive for your purpose here. It's finding harmony, isn't it? Or some sort of balance. It sounds to me, it resonates that way. I think so. Right? Like balance, harmony. I know you talk in your book, you talk about the brain, the mind, and the essence. You call it essence. Could we replace the word essence with anything else like uh, other words that have been used by so many people? Consciousness, the divine, God, the universe, source, Or the essence you speak of, it's a different one. No, it is exactly what you said. However, I want to portray to those who don't ascribe to all of that, that meditation is still really, really helpful because it is a a portion of yourself that if, unless you integrate it, you will feel dysregulated, you will feel ill at ease, you'll feel unintegrated. You, there, you'll you know that something's missing. And if you can make that connection to that deepest part of yourself, it can change the way you feel. It can change your life. Yes, I absolutely agree. I have meditated for a long time. It sounds like it. Yeah, I stopped for some reason. To me, these days, meditation became almost everything I do. It's mm-hmm. the moment to be in the moment. Whatever I do, I'm here now. And it's, um, I mean, I, I have fun. I lose track of time, which has been uh, an issue quite here on the podcast. <laughs> the, before the <laughs> off record, <laughs> always being a few minute, minutes late because I'm always like absorbed into whatever I'm doing in the moment and I lose track of time. Mm-hmm. So talk to me for a moment about how does it feel to meditate to you and what is the right way to do it if there is one? Well, let's start with saying there is no <laughs> one right way. <laughs> that, is, yes. that is like my whole message. If I have a message, yes. that's it. The right yes. way is what works for you. And you can try a lot of different methods and things will resonate and pay attention to resonance because I think resonance is a divine quality. It is something that comes from beyond ourselves. And so I was just talking with one of my sons last night and he was saying how for him, you know, just getting really off on some creative idea is 
it puts him in that place. And that's, that's exactly your, your mind's not running dialogue off with somebody else or what happened to you before you're right there. And that's what you're seeking is to be right there with your entire being and whatever does that for you. Some people, it might be music. Some people, it might be movement. There are walking meditations. I wanted something quiet because for me, as, and you know that in the beginning of my book, my, my quote from Lao Tzu, uh, the greatest revelation is stillness. Stillness is where I find that peace in myself. And I do everything I can to calm my body and calm my mind. And when I do that, I am open to these things. I, I think we all experience like um, light bulb ideas. You know, they just pop into your brain or maybe they just kind of sift in real slowly from the side. That's the other part of your being speaking to you. And we get too busy to listen. So true. Would you call that intuition, listening to the heart, Peggy, too? In, intuition, creativity. Mm, uh, yeah. Incredible problem solving. I think it's where Einstein's theory of relativity came from. It's not something that you can access by reason. You can't sit down and ponder a problem and come to these results unless you are in that place because they are given to us. We don't come up with them. What is your understanding of the mind and the brain, Peggy? Well, I, in my book, I do talk about the mind, the brain, the essence. And I did that because I, I assume my experience may apply to other people. I kind of lived my life feeling like this wholly integrated thing that wasn't, there was no separation of anything. I'm all one bundle of whatever I am. And that leads me to follow my mind, which did not lead me very good places all the time. So I meditating one day, I just thought, you know, how is it that there are, it feels separate. There feels like there's this little separation, like the space between breaths kind of separation, tiny. But I came up with this full construct. I didn't come up with it. It just sort of came to me during meditation. And I actually had to draw it out on a piece of typing paper so I could understand it. But it, the mind to me is our human organism. It's our biological organism. And it's what perceives everything. You're all through all of your senses. The perceptions come in and then the mind takes over and the mind assesses it, judges it, sorts it, does what it needs to do with it. And our mind is really our intelligence. And it's great, like I say, when it comes to trivial pursuit or some of those other, you know, like uh, very obsolete kind of pieces of information that you harbor in the corners, but your mind is that, but it is not you because there is still that quality of things that come to you. Where, where is that? Everybody is familiar with being in a situation that's high stress or high uh, jeopardy. And some, it, it's like the world slows down and a almost like a voice walks you through it very slowly, a very compassionate, friendly, knowing voice or feeling. And that's what we're trying to connect with. And that's the essence, right? That's the essence. Yeah, that's interesting. In a lot of ways, we think that essence cannot be described, but in a way it can, right, Peggy? I, I feel like it can. I mean, it's certainly um, beyond all description. It's not like we could capture it entirely, but you can get glimpses of it, like little snapshots of it. Yes. And I love your art. That's another. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Wow. <laughs> How did, what was the inspiration? Actually, let me ask you about your book, the inspiration for your book first. The title is Meditation Manual, Simple Directions for a Life-Changing Practice. So what was actually the main intention of writing your book? And also talk to me for a moment about art. Okay, <laughs> what certainly. inspired you? <laughs> uh, my main intention for writing the book, as I said, it wasn't like I thought, oh, I'm an authority on meditation. I'm going to write a meditation book. It was that I knew I had a pathway that got me there predictably. And as I broke it down, it had some pretty simple components. And I thought, well, okay, so I could write 
sort of like the short version of your car manual. You know, the car oh, things yeah. come with those giant manuals and then there's yes. a little shorty version. I'm going right. to write the little shorty version. <laughs> yeah. And I want anyone to be able to pick it up and enjoy the process. It may not be their ultimate process, but it may give them a sample of something they've never experienced before. Or it may be someone like you, Val- Valeria, that you've like, you've had deep experience with meditation, but you kind of lost track of it. And I honestly believe unless you have the sole focus of your life is contemplation, everybody's meditation practice waxes and wanes over life. It just does. It comes in, it pops out. It's just what happens. But someone like you, it might go, it might be a, a visual or sensory experience for you going through the steps and you go, Oh, this really resonates. Well then use this for a while. So I just was trying to get something on paper that was, it it didn't have any of the spiritual underpinnings that much of meditation does as an ancient, ancient practice, but it doesn't have to be aligned with any kind of spirituality, any kind of religion. It is just a really great life skill. And I think everyone should have access to it. Yeah. So that's why I wrote the book. Right. Beautiful. I love your intention. I love how simple it is, too, because that caught my attention. I think I mentioned off record that the deepest truths that I have came across, they are very simple. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I love that about your work, too. And I wanted the even the pages to reflect that. So I designed the size of the font to be not too many words on a single page and just like you're flipping through it really easy. I wanted people who don't enjoy reading to be able to get through the book. And in fact, I, I have a friend who has suffered from dyslexia his entire life. And he called me after he read the book because uh-huh. I read this book. <laughs> it was yeah. really meaningful to me because everyone should be able to do this. So, and, and my plan is that I will, all, I'm also going into the studio, I think next month to actually narrate it for Audible. So it's my hope that that will, um, will be another oh, asset for people. That will be wonderful because uh, guided meditations, I remember when I started, that was big for me. It was so mm-hmm. helpful. Please let me know and I can have that on your website too, on your podcast profile. Absolutely. I will do that. So about the art, it's so beautiful the way you paint. Thank you. What inspired you to paint in such a way? <laughs> it's really beautiful. Oh, well, I, I painted as a child and it was something that I thought would be my life, but I also really liked school. Uh (laughs) I really enjoyed science and math and I really enjoyed all of that stuff. So uh, my dad asked me a very powerful question when I was young, would it be as much fun for you if you had to earn a living at it? And I thought, Hmm, perhaps not. So I let it go for 30 years. And after 30 years, I thought, well, man, I probably can't even draw. So I better, uh, I better check that out. And I just took a little drawing class and it's like, Oh, this does something for me. So then I tried another, like, I'm an adult now. I need like to have an instructor. And I started with a painting instructor and, you know, I love nature. I, I love landscapes and it just didn't light me up when I was painting So she asked me, you know, what is it that really, you know, ignites you? And it's always been animals. I love animals. And so she said, well, tell you what, I'm going to see if we can't work out a way with what you love to figure out how you could paint. And so she did a fabulous job of encouraging me to use the colors that I see. And I, it just kind of all connected. It just all came together. So um, I've been painting again since about 2010 and, uh, really, you know, it's a, actually, was it before then? Boy, I don't, I can't even remember, but I, it is, it's been a wonderful part of my journey. And I was reflecting yesterday, uh, how art, art really taught me a lot about myself, you know, that to be non-judgmental, which is so hard and, and not to compare. Comparison is just the bane of discomfort and suffering. (laughs) And so it it really has been a wonderful journey for me as well. And I so love when someone treasures 
something that I've done for them. It's just like, ah, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful feeling because you, you experience this piece of yourself going to them. It's healing. That's Mm. what it is. When I look at your paintings, that's what comes to me. It's very relaxing, which I connect to healing. If we can relax, we can heal. (laughs) For sure. We have three quotes on your website under the art page. Oh, yeah. There's one that resonated with me where it says, if you could say it in words, there would be no reason to paint. Edward Hopper, his name? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I I really believe that. I believe that it's creative expression in any form is a really beautiful soul expression. And so I would never, ever discourage anybody. But there is something that absolutely really strums the chords inside you when you see something that's them or an expression of them in the in the work. Do you coach the meditation guide? How do you do that, Peg? Do you meet people online, offline? You know, I haven't really um, explored that part of it. I have been getting some requests. So I really, it's not something I've um, fleshed out at all because it wasn't, you know, I I was just handing over this little gift to the universe and saying, (laughs) okay, here it is. So I don't know. It's interesting that you asked that. I may need to be thinking about that. Please let me know. If you add that as a service on your website, please let me know. Okay, will do. And another I want to mention about the book, the exercise you have, there are four of them. And one that caught my attention the most is um, exercise one, the breath, ocean breathing. I loved that one. There's a part there that you say, I think towards the end, your breath now mirrors the sound of a gentle surf. You are the ocean. Beautifully written. Thank so, you. So talk to me for a moment about those exercises. Do we follow the order or do we choose them by intuition? Actually, they, they are built to be sequential. And to, uh, to the point that when you're doing the fourth one, you actually do the prior three to get in a place to do the fourth one. So The very first one is about settling your body and your mind just from whatever your day has been. And that's the ocean breathing one. And it really, um, I find sometimes on on the highway, I use ocean breathing to kind of (laughs) gather myself. So each one of these exercises are really little mini meditations. There are samples of the meditative state and they help to center and ground you and they do build on each other. Okay, that's a good, very good note to know. I'm very intuitive with the things I do mm-hmm. and whatever I read. So I just go to whatever my the attention wants to go. It's good to know that we need to follow the steps as steps. Well, but, I, but with that, I would add the proviso that you don't need to do anything. Mm-hmm. If you read one mm-hmm. thing in the book and it sends you down a path toward this answer for yourself, toward this life skill, use it. You don't need to use any other part of it. The book isn't, it isn't saying this is the way. This is just saying this is a way. And if it brings you to something else that takes you down another path that's more meaningful to you, then I've done my job. That's (laughs) fantastic. Yeah, I love the openness. Thank you, Peg, for saying that. So we're almost at the end. I do have a few more questions for you, the ending questions. Would you like to add anything else or read a passage in your book? I think I wouldn't mind just reading my my preface just so that people have a real idea of what this is. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. This book is a bite-sized guide to help you immediately begin meditating or enhance your meditation practice. Easy to read in 20 to 30 minutes. It's not like other meditation books. Those are typically 200 to 300 pages, explaining various traditions, philosophies, techniques, and scientific data. Great for understanding meditation and why it works. This is not that. Whether you are new to meditation, looking to begin anew, a current meditation app user wishing for something more, or a seasoned meditator wanting a fresh experience, this little book can help you awaken to a level of awareness you may not have known possible. 
I love your intention in your work. Thank you so much, Becky. Thank for, you. For being you and being open <laughs> to life, <laughs> to the essence, Thank really. Thank you, Valeria. That's so nice. Thank you. How do you define freedom these days, Becky? I think um, we freedom, to me, is a spiritual concept. And I think, you know, you look at Nelson Mandela, who was imprisoned for how long, and his spirit was never imprisoned. And I think that is the truest freedom, is to fully understand and activate and live out your spirit. And my second question is this one. What do you love most about being in a human body? Oh my God, the world is so sweet. <laughs> I love so much, Valeria. I, You know, there's this, I don't know if you ever saw the old movie, Michael with John Travolta. In mm, it. Yes. yes and, and there's the scene in the field with the bull where he just says, I will miss all of this. And then there's the scene when he's beginning to pass and he says, life is just so sweet. I am so fueled and enriched and and sated by the beauty around me in the world. It's just every day I, I, I never give up gratitude for it because there's just so much that touches me. So that's what I love the most is I feel so touched. And I think by design, that is what the creator is looking for is how does this world touch us? Another beautiful message and reminder for all of us. I love the way you say that too, because that makes me think about that your mind has been illuminated by the essence mm -hmm. and that's a reflection of it. So mm -hmm. you're able to see yeah, through that reflection, see everything with gratitude, with beauty. It's really amazing to meet human beings like that, that are open enough to let essence shine and reflect. That's so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> really beautiful though. My last question is, what are three things you wish everyone to experience before they lose the body, before they die? The beauty of the world around us, the love and connection of other human beings, and touching the face of the Almighty from within this life. Thank you so much again, Peggy. Absolutely, Valeria. Everything you do, the way you do it, this beautiful and sincere desire to help others. Uh, and your expression in this reality, it's really beautiful. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. Where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Well, my website is my name, PeggyLeddington.com. And um, my book is on sale through Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, it's sort of the standard standard group. You can also go on Book Baby's bookstore, and that's the publishing house, and they also have a page with my book available. Wonderful. I'll have the website on your podcast profile. Thank you. And then when you have the audio format out there, please let me know so I can add that and the services too. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peggy. We'll talk soon. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Peggy Luddington and her work, please visit PeggyLuddington.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now. <laughs>